I'm pleased to call to order this meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Tuesday, December 18th, 2018. If Mr. Saris and Mr. <coughs> Dixit could please come forward. Good evening. Good, Good evening, afternoon. Madam Chair and Superintendent. Thank you. We have eight contracts on the agenda this evening as exhibits I-1 through I-8. If you would please present the first contract. Yes, MWE 85714, Special Education Services, Speech, Occupational and Physical Therapies, Audiology, and education of the deaf, hard of hearing using sign language. This is a consent to the assignment of this contract from Provida Staff LLC to EDU Healthcare LLC. Uh, this is just one of 26 uh, vendors that were approved by the board in August 2015 and uh, we are not requesting any change in spending authority, merely to approve uh, the uh, corporate name change uh, and the entity with which we'll do business and, uh, and receive invoices and pay. Thank you. Do we know the reason for the name change? Was there a transfer of ownership or is it the same entity? Well, uh, it's simply a name change according to the correspondence we received from the awarded vendor. Great. Committee members, any other questions? I have the information from the questions that were sent. Would you like responses to those? Yes, please. Sure. So the first one was about background, and um, we do have BCPS employees that provide all of these related services, but when we have enrollments or children identified through the school year who need additional services more than the current staff could provide, we use contracted services. So that's what this is about. These are um, multiple different related service providers, so if you'd like me to run through. The um, speech and language therapy, we have SLPs here. There are 185.9 BCPS SLPs, and we are contracting out the school year 23 to serve 7,668 school-based services and 520 uh, what we call service plans. So there are parentally placed students at private schools, and we service them as well. For occupational therapy, in Baltimore County, we have 63.4 FTEs, and we use 7.8 contractors to serve 2,322 school-based services and 64 service plans. For physical therapy, we have 25.2 FTEs in BCPS, and we are using a .6 contractor right now to serve 454 school-based services and five service plans in private schools. For audiology, uh, right now we have four audiologists in BCPS serving 166 school-based and the service plans. We don't have any contractors this year yet. For deaf and hard of hearing, we have 16 uh, interpreters and 16.2 teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, which serve 192 school-based services. Uh, we use the .4 contractor to service the 13 service plans. There was a question about medical insurance, and no, we do not collect that information. These services are all done with um, through the IEP plan uh, team price process, and if the students have services on their individualized education program, they are provided those services. It's not contingent on them having medical insurance. We don't collect that information from them. What we do do is if children are on um, medical assistance, there's a third party billing process that's separate outside of them receiving the um, services in BCPS. Uh, there was a question about how much is educational versus testing services. What happens there is most of it is uh, the service, direct service to the child, and the testing again goes by the IEP team pr process. If uh, students, it's requested through an IEP team that they are tested, that might be something that's done. Typically it happens every three years. It could happen more often than that, but that's the typical time. 
um, there was a question about how students and parents obtain the service, and again, that's through the IEP team process. The parents are a team member, and through that process, it's determined if testing is needed, it's determined what the hours of service that are provided for the child. I believe those, that was most of the questions. If there's others, and I'm happy to answer them. A couple of uh, questions were, were based on the uh, procurement process um, regarding the 26 different vendors. Um, as you know, we have uh, thousands of students who require services. And so uh, in, in a bid such as this, we will obtain uh, rates from uh, any providers that care to uh, submit bids. Um, we make sure that they're licensed and that they uh, have satisfactory references and uh, that uh, so that whenever there's a student with a need, uh, we, we have a range of options to make sure that we can cover those needs. There are 14 different hourly rates for the different services in this uh, contract uh, and including rates for home visits and rates, uh, you know, for sign language, rates for, uh, you know, multiple locations throughout the county and so forth. And um, the, uh, each of these providers will, I mean, the services are provided by an individual. So each of the providers will assign an individual uh, practitioner. Uh, if for any reason we are not satisfied with the performance, we will ask that, uh, that provider to, you, to send us a different uh, practitioner or we have the option of uh, selecting another vendor that also bid on the same services. Board members, are there any additional questions regarding this contract? Hearing none, I think okay. we're ready to move on. Second item uh, that we have is JNI 73515, grades K through five mathematics. And this is for Everyday Counts Partner Games. This is a contract modification to provide for continued use of Everyday Partner, Everyday Counts Partner Games. Uh, supplemental materials for the Department of Academics. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $130,000, bringing total revised contract spending authority to $230,000 with the one awarded vendor approved by the board in uh, June 2015. I also received questions. Yes. Would you like me to go through them yes, as please. well? Yes, please. Thank okay. you. Um, so the first question was, please provide the specific nature of these games and how they are used during instruction. Um, these are print materials. They are quite honestly a, a teacher's kit and the essential class materials of um, what we would traditionally call board games, but they're mathematically related. They are used as part of the teacher-led small group instruction in the ELO program, which is our extended learning opportunity or what we used to know as summer school. Um, they support foundational mathematical concepts and build essential um, number concepts and promote math talk and build mathematical vocabulary. The second question I sort of answered already, but are these games digital or traditional? They are traditional. Um, the components of the games include, there are 20 different games in each kit. They include the game boards, <clears throat> as well as a variety of math manipulatives used to play the games, including things like 10 frames, number image cards, colored chips, number cubes, and there is a teacher's guide included as well. The fourth question was how many students within the school system benefit from the use of these games? So as I mentioned, the primary use of these materials is in the ELO or extended learning opportunity and each summer we have approximately 5,000 students that participate in extended learning opportunities at the elementary level. Um, in addition, we do have some schools that have then purchased materials for use as part of their small group instruction in the building. Um, the increase in spending authority is requested as a result of increase. The question was, are the materials licensed for use on a per user or per usage basis? So it's not a licensed product per student user, but more by teacher kit. Um, but we do purchase the teacher and the class materials, um, the class packs, if you will, so that the manipulatives I mentioned would have enough for the students. So the pricing is per teacher kit, essentially. 
Um, I mentioned the other question was how many students currently benefit. So again, each summer there's approximately 5,000 students. Um, we began using these materials in the summer of 2015. So there's been four summers, although I can't say that some of those students weren't the same students um, in multiple years. Um, and again, some schools, what has happened in the past is if a teacher was a summer school teacher and became familiar with the program, then oftentimes they go back to school and say to their principal, I'd like to you know, suggest using this in our school. So we do have some schools that use it during the school year as well. And then the last question was about Title I funding. Does Title I funding cover the use of the materials in the suburb program? And the answer is yes. Title I funding covers that. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions? No? OK. Thank you. Thank you. Right the uh, next item is JNI 77016, Psychological Assessment Tests, Forms, and Scoring Programs. This contract modification will provide for the continued use of psychological assessment tests, forms, and scoring programs for the Division of School Climate and Safety. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $1.65 million bringing the revised total contract spending authority to $2.2 million with the six uh, awarded vendors approved by the board in April of 2016. Thank you. And I believe several questions were submitted on this as well. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, the first question was um, explaining the process for how students get assessed and psychological testing is a necessary part of the federally mandated comprehensive evaluation process to determine special education liability, uh, eligibility. Um, our educational teams, such as our student support teams, our individualized education program teams, can request those assessments. The assessments are related to the suspected disability, so it can be one assessment or several assessments. And before any assessment is provided, parental permission must be obtained. Once that parental permission is obtained, our psychologists have a 60-day period to complete an initial evaluation or a 90-day uh, period for a reevaluation. During that period, psychologists also collect information via interviews with parents, teachers, mental health providers, they review existing student records, they conduct observations of the student, and they also administer individualized standardized test measures. The second question uh, was regarding medical insurance and would medical insurance cover those costs? Uh, only psych uh, licensed psychologists can bill for psychological assessments through third party bill billing, and at this time only 14 of our psychologists are licensed. The third question um, is, are these services underutilized? Uh, actually, we have seen an increase in the number of assessments that we're providing. Um, from 2016 to 2017, we saw the number of assessments go up from 6,669 the previous year to 7,215 for an increase of 8.2%. From 27, in 2017, 2018, we saw an increase from 7,215 assessments to 8,235 for an increase, uh, for a percentage increase of 14.1%. We've also seen an increase in the number of our students and thus an increase in the number of assessments being recommended. And we also have an increase in our number of school psychologists. We increased um, by 14 to now 101 school psychologists. An increase of 14. Yes. Um, the, another question was around the pricing structure for the test forms and programs. Uh, the assessments can range anywhere from $272 to $1,259. And so, uh, again, a wide range depending on the type of assessment that's provided. 
And um, in terms of the WISC, for example, there is a scoring license uh, per staff member for use over a five-year period that costs $165 per staff member for five years. And then the last question uh, relates to, are the tests and forms digital or paper-based? They are both. And then I believe that Mr. Saris has some other questions. Um, on, I think on this, the only thing I uh, can add would be that of the uh, $481,084 spent to date, uh, approximately 17%, or about $81,000 are grant funded, and the, uh, the remainder are uh, general operating funds, 400,000, just over $400,000. I did have a follow-up question regarding the pricing structure. I'm not clear as to whether it's per use in terms of a single student <clears throat> taking that assessment, um, you mentioned that there is a score or evaluator fee that's paid annually, but I'm unclear as to the student. Is that per use that we are I'm charged? I'm gonna bring up Dr. Alicia Bennett, our coordinator of psychological services to answer that question. Thank you. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Thank you. So for each test kit, the test kit itself, which has a manual and a test booklet, um, those can be used over and over, but there are forms or protocol that come with that, and that's per student or per teacher that has to fill out the form or per parent. So what um, gets exhausted are the forms that go with each um, assessment administration um, that we have to order over and over and over again. Either the paper or digital. It's the, yes, the, the per be, use fee. Correct, yes. So for um, the digital, for instance, mm -hmm. sometimes um, for the online measures, uh, parents and um, teachers are able to complete their surveys online, but we have a certain limit, and that's uh, per staff member. So, so each staff member has to have like a license in order to use that. And then once those forms are exhausted, we have to order more, even the digital ones. So there are times when people are um, trying to figure out if they can get other forms from other staff members who maybe didn't use what's in their pot, um, which creates a lot of um, borrowing and begging um, for more forms to do additional assessments. And, and that's the, the underlying thought process behind my question is given the demand and we're seeing an increase demand in this service, mm -hmm. have we explored options to purchase these services as a system overall that does not limit our use of them so that they are available in, in plenitude to, to students who do need it? And are we meeting the current demand or is that a constraint based on the purchasing authority? I think that uh, we, we work within our budget and um, purchase what we are able to purchase. Um, I don't know that I can so answer the question about the spending. We are, we're not purchasing services. We're really purchasing materials that are used by our professionals. And there are literally uh, dozens of items here that we purchase, and I don't know if uh, Dr. Bennett wants to refer to any of these, um, just as an example. So uh, we uh, have not experienced any budgetary constraints, I think, uh, with the additional staffing uh, that we request. Uh, it's because there's a need among students, and that's really uh, our uh, uh, the only limiting factor, and of course we uh, will indicate in our proposed budget for next year mm -hmm. any additional needs. Sure, and our interest is that of the students. We don't want students to be turned away, and we recognize that these are tools that are needed mm -hmm. to be able to receive the full support that they need. So my interest is have we explored options? Is there a need to purchase these kind of in a different fashion in terms of structuring rather than a per use to system-wide, and is that something these vendors offer? 
So I just wanted to offer, I don't believe, we're not turning any students away. Uh, no, So that just don't want us not. to leave with that kind of uh, sentiment. We're not turning students away, and certainly the contract before you is the one that will um, fulfill the need um, based on the, the, the needs that are coming before us. Mm -hmm. So if we were going to bid for services, we would need to present an entirely different contract. Sure, and I misspoke. Rather than services, these are tools that enable us to provide those services. Correct. So that is clear. Right. Thank you. I believe Ms. Rowe had her hand up. You have a question? So is there any thought to how much volume we would need to be doing as a school system before we would attempt to try to have some sort of, for lack of a better word, bulk purchasing arrangement? Have we reached that point yet? Or is it still cost effective to do per use, I think is what Julie's trying to get at. Uh, that is something that we would have to uh, rep uh, analyze and report back to you. We're current, the current service model that we have has been in place, you know, with individual providers uh, on staff for many years. Uh, so if that is to change, we'll have to consider, uh, consider that and, and advise you. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the question. So the, the question is, it's, or should we purchase more than what we need? Um, well, the, like, is so that the question? If I go to the store and I buy five of something, mm -hmm. it might be beneficial to purchase five in a retail store. If I need 250000 well, at that point, I might build my own factory. But so I guess my point is, we're paying a lot of money. The percentage increase is not the same as the percentage of our cost increase. Our cost increase seems to be a lot more than our percentages of students using this. So if our cost increase is substantially more than the percentage of students, then at a certain point you have to say, well, where are the price breaks? And try to negotiate either with this company or with another company about I just want to make sure that we're constantly evaluating how cost effective the way that we procure these the, the um, materials that we need. It's not that I would want to reduce materials, but if it's more cost effective to buy more than we need, knowing that we're going to need them, I don't really see how that's a problem. Um, a, a point of clarification, if I could. Um, one of the, what I, what I believe I'm hearing might be under, underscored by a belief that each of the assessments requires the same number of forms, and that isn't the case. So a student may require three forms. Mm -hmm. The next student may require 10 forms. And so it is not that we could just buy 300 of the same form, but we have multiple different forms and components that are required. So uh, budgeting that out is a little bit different because it does vary by the student and his or her suspected disability and what the psychologist then has to assess for. Okay, so you sort of do this and obtain these items sort of as they're needed along the way? Correct. All right, so just because there's a spending authority of this doesn't even necessarily mean we're gonna spend it all. It just means it's available to spend, but we get these materials as we need them. Correct. All right. And they have different unit prices. So it's really complicated is what you're saying. Yes. It's like, it's not, they're, they're, uh, uh, right, yeah, it's not, well, it's good for us to know that though. <laughs> it's, you know, they're, don't they're excuse core, they're, my ignorance. No, no, it's not ignorance. I buy paper products. <laughs> there are core forms that are always okay. used, for example, maybe one or two. And then there are mm -hmm. all these other additional forms that are used based again on the suspected disability of the student. So this is really just highly intensive diagnostic materials that get very specific then. Correct. So there's not really a way to... What I'm hearing you say like is that there's not really a way to just go say, well, we're going to need, we're expecting this projection to increase use. We're going to need like, all right, I see all the heads shaking. Okay. <laughs> yes, Mr. McMillian. I'm trying to navigate my way through this form. So I just want, so the prior board approval was April 19th of 2016. So that's Correct. the last time this particular contract came before the board? That was the, that was the initial presentation of this contract to the board. Okay. And so then it shows the prior end date is uh, April 30th, 2026. So is it common practice to do this 10 years down the road? 
Uh, typically five to 10 years are the contract terms for different types of, uh, depending on the bid or the RFP, yes. So if we vote on this and approve it, we won't see something like this come back through until 2016? Or, or uh, 26? It, uh, in theory, uh, we've experienced in the first two years about a $240,000 a year cost uh, based on our experience with these products. So uh, the reason we're coming back to you is given the, the term of the contract that you correctly noted, we want to uh, realign the spending authority with our actual experience. So we project that over the remaining eight years uh, at, a, at just over $200,000 a year, we will need to increase this spending authority. Any contract uh, of the boards can be terminated at any time, either for cause or convenience. And so we, don't, we have no reason to believe that we'll come back to you at this time. Um, but it's in, in eight more years, it's, it's entirely possible. And, and lastly, so the previous contract spending authority was $550,000. The modification amount is $1,650,000. So Correct. is that normal to triple what's asked for, the modification? Well, I don't know when we, when we take a new contract and we don't, uh, we haven't had that experience with it, uh, we may not be able to make the best possible estimate initially and so based on the past two years of actual experience we're revising that estimate okay thank you okay ms Rao. so given the amount of increase of this how is the budget line item that this is associated with faring with this kind of increase so in other words the this contract is attached to a line item in the budget. Is there enough money left in that line item to spend this? Yes, but we don't, the budget only lasts a year. So mm -hmm. every year that spending of that budget is uh, evaluated and adopted for an additional year. So, and if in any year that budget goes away, then we do not, we would not be able to exercise this contract. So. We're expecting then, if we approve this contract for this amount, for the line item in the budget to increase to reflect this. Uh, Is that how this works? The the annual the annual the budget, annual, yeah. uh, budget uh, will is proposed to increase in FY20 based okay. on our current experience. Okay, and so is this? Um, I mean, these are special education assessments. Is this? Um, is, has there been a substantial increase in special education assessments? We have an increase overall in students who are being uh, identified with multiple disabilities, students who are being identified um, with um, more in terms of autism, um, uh, developmental delays and such. So this is usually one of the first steps in the process in terms of the psychological assessments that are um, provided. So we are seeing an increase in students um, who have who are being diagnosed with multiple disabilities? Okay. We had over 800 students new to the system this year mm -hmm. who needed these types of evaluations. So, are we using the results of these types of evaluations in the increase in the need for a contract like this to project out um, staffing needs as well for special education students? We have an entire special education staffing plan that's based on the current enrollment and projections and looking at the trends in terms of um, the needs. It's, so it's a needs-based assessment and there's public input, as you know, and as part of that process as well. That, that together creates our special education staffing plan that's also a part of our operating budget that we'll be bringing before you. Any other questions? Mr. Kuhn. So I had a few questions based on what you had said earlier about the 60 to 90 days to, is, to execute one of these, um, these assessments. Is that the time frame from what? By law. Okay, so I guess my question is what's the trigger that starts the time 
the, I the IEP being written? The IEP team making a recommendation for assessment. Okay. And that the per parental permission has been obtained. All right, so um, you said that there are 14 licensed psychiatrists? Psychologists. Psychologists, right, that can, because you're talking about can you bill health? There's plans. well over 100. Uh, right, I, I heard that. Yeah. But I heard we have 14 that are actually licensed. That in essence, and you said that in conjunction with being able to bill third parties. So when they are administering these um, assessments, are, are we as a system billing third parties or not? When the, the yes. when the students are Medicaid eligible, then uh, we are uh, able to uh, submit for federal reimbursement for the services provided. And, and the federal government within that third party billing program requires that we use licensed providers. So, so we would draw on those staff who met the qualifications when serving Medicaid eligible students. So beyond Medicaid eligible students, are we billing private third party insurance for this? No. And why would we not do that? We must provide a free and appropriate public education under Maryland law and the uh, and those services are considered part of the programs that we provide for free. All right, so it sounds like there's a discrepancy where we're willing to bill the federal government for something, but if there's private insurance, health insurance that a family has, we're not willing to bill them. We are not able to. Mm, okay, that's interesting. And then, um, and I don't expect you to have, you, you probably don't have this now, but you said that the assessments range from $272 to over $1,000 per assessment. Um, and I don't expect this now, but can you provide the board with the actual list and name of every assessment and the cost associated with it? You've, you've got it? Okay, great. You don't have to, you don't have to get to me now. I, I would like everyone to see it just so that we have it for, for reference. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Mr. Zaris, I think we're up to I-4. Okay, next item, JNI 75513, Space for Graduation Exercises. This is another consent to an assignment of this contract from <coughs> University of Maryland, Baltimore County to Pinnacle Venue Services, LLC, a Texas limited liability company for the continued use of rental space for graduation exercises for high schools. There are, uh, let's see, it says here there are, uh, there are two other, well there are two awarded vendors approved by the board in 2013. We have since added, well there are actually three. So there are Coppin State, Towson University and University of Maryland, Baltimore County uh, that are the three providers uh, under our current agreement. And uh, UMBC has subcontracted the management of their newly renovated facility with uh, Pinnacle Venue Service. And uh, we are asking authority uh, to service this contract under that arrangement. Thank you. I believe board members submitted questions in advance on this contract as well. That is yes. correct. If you could review those, please. So the first one was uh, provide a description of the venue and what it uh, actually looks like. Uh, the center is a 6,000 seat multi-purpose venue. And um, I have a picture actually of the, one of our graduation ceremonies taking place there. And again, uh, stadium style seating, um, the floor is, uh, are, uh, accommodate the, the students, uh, graduates that are on the stage. And so, and then um, here's sort of the, the seating plan um, and the concert floor plan uh, for any event. 
The second question, is a seven-year term typical for this contract? Yeah, as I said, uh, this is a five-year contract, which is a typical term, and in this case, uh, we have the option to uh, extend for two more years. And the third question is, why are graduation services under the Department of Social Emotional Support? Uh, are the Office of, or the Department of Social Emotional Support has our guidance department, um, is one of the offices that reports to me. Historically, this is a, um, going back more than five years, uh, individual high schools would be uh, handling this themselves out of their school budgets. And it was creating a certain amount of confusion and vying for space and priority in these spaces. And so we brought this uh, into the central office to, uh, to manage better, uh, to identify facilities that had the adequate security and uh, and, and parking and, and other supports that we needed um, and to uh, hopefully obtain a more competitive price and to better uh, provide the venues so that each school's different schedules could be adequately met. And we've been able to do that uh, with these three options that high schools now have. And we provided some relief to high school budgets. In terms of the pricing they could obtain yes. on their own. Right. Great. Mr. McMillian. So we have, if, if I'm not mistaken, 24 traditional high schools. Correct. Out of the 24, are all of them going to go to UMBC or in the past? No. Of yeah. Uh, uh, well, I don't have a school by. S well, I might have, but basically, 20 last year, 21 of the 24 high schools used the Towson University facility, and three used UMBC. The three schools are Woodlawn High School, Lansdowne, Lansdowne, Lansdowne High School, and Catonsville High School. Did anybody use Compton? No. This money is a, appropriated for the high schools to use, and so it can be spent at UMBC, it can be spent at Towson, or if necessary, it can be spent at Coffin. Correct. But it's it's administered by the off by the center the central office. Dr. Nieves pays those bills. The high schools individually do not pay for those services. Right. And so the the different colleges, they use Pinnacle Venue Services to make all these arrangements? This is just UMBC, in this case, that has assigned this contract uh, to this to Pinnacle Services. Towson University manages its, as far as I know, manages its own, um, because I think that's who I pay the bill to, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little slow with numbers, but I'm still, so $2,184,000 is going to be appropriated to UMBC. No. no. To Pinnacle. No. Okay. Uh, last year, uh, the rate per graduation at UMBC was about uh, $13,500. So that was what uh, one event at UMBC, UMBC cost. This price is over the seven year term for all three uh, venues for eight graduations. So it's just under $300,000 a year, I think, um, yeah, in total. But we only pay, you know, one graduation season at a time over the eight different budgets that we hope to have funding for this program. Thank you. Other questions for members? Mr. Kuhn? I was just curious, how much does Towson University cost? Uh, let's see here. So I paid them all in one. We can provide that. Yeah. We can get that for you. Okay. It's in the in this thirteen fourteen thousand. Okay, dollar that's range, fine. As long as it's not a hundred thousand dollars of school. No, no. Thank you. 
Ms. Rowe? I think um, I would like you to explain the difference between how much something costs and what we're paying on it and a spending authority. So the spending authority is the, the term for which uh, a, con a vendor will hold its pricing. So we go out to bid, we award a contract, and based on that pricing, where as I said, where it's typically a five or a 10 year period, we project uh, what we are going to use over the full term and ask for board authority to spend that money over five or 10 different budget years. And over that term, the vendor has agreed to provide the pricing stated in the original bid, and in most cases, with only in some adjustments for CPI, hold that pricing uh, based on the scope and terms agreed to in the original bid. So uh, the spending authority here is over this eight-year term. We do not have $2.2 million in this year's budget for graduation. We have about $275,000 or $300,000 a year for the next eight years. So even though there's a spending authority for this, if it doesn't get appropriated in the budget, Correct. in other words, we're not, just because we have this spending authority, it doesn't mean that we're ever going to spend money that we don't Correct. actually have in the budget. Correct. I do because not one of the things this. I'm looking at yeah. with these contracts and these amounts is if we were going to get into trouble and somehow spend more money than what we have allocated for the line item in this contract, I don't see how anyone on the board when, there's nothing in here that would give us a red flag that that was going to happen. So um, I Except just want to make sure. We are obligated under state law to maintain the spending, the budget authority okay. that's granted each year by the board and the county and the state. So theoretically, you could have contracts with a certain amount of spending authority, but if the budget doesn't allocate that amount, then you all have to go back and adjust all that? Correct. Or the spending itself just doesn't happen? It doesn't happen. Okay. We're not going to violate the budgetary authority that's given us. That's a very, very clear in, in board policy and in the county charter and in state law. We cannot, we must operate within those legal restrictions. If at some point in the future, how do I do this, Julie? If at some point in the future we can have a couple of pages on that We've, stuff uh, you just said. <laughs> we're going to prepare a sort of a procurement summary for the, this committee and the full board and we'll, uh, we did it a, a year or two ago and we'll uh, update that information and come back to you. That was very helpful. Thank you. That would be great for the new board and new committee. Terrific. Ms. Rowe, thank you. Next contract, please. Okay. Uh, next item is MBU 50318, Physical Examinations. Uh, this contract modification will provide for the continued physical examination services uh, to include drug and alcohol testing. Uh, approval is requested to add Concentra Medical Compliance Administrator, or CMCA, a department within Concentral Medical Centers as the specific provider of drug and alcohol testing services performed by Concentra. Uh, Occupational Health Centers of Southwestern Pennsylvania, of, South, of the Southwest PA, doing business as Concentra Medical Centers, was the single award bidder approved by the board in September 2017. Thank you. I believe board members submitted a couple of questions. Yeah, on Vice this Chair, one. board members, good evening. Good evening. Um, the question was asked, we have maintenance employees with exposure to asbestos, PCBs, and lead. No, we do not. We currently um, contract all work out that would potentially um, result in an exposure. Um, this is, if you read in the contract, it's a medical surveillance program. It's required by OSHA, so we keep it in our contract for physical exams. We have never utilized the services. We have not had any exposure. Uh, and one question uh, that I had was about the budget line item. Uh, 
so the funds for this contract are budgeted in three areas, the Office of, uh, the Department of Facilities, Office of Grounds Maintenance, um, and in the Office of Transportation, and in, uh, under uh, the Division of Human Resources, the Office of Absence and Risk Management, which is managed by Dr. Allen. And the actual line item is 2834 contracted services. But it, there's that same line item exists in all three of those offices. Ms. Rowe? So we can have a contract that we authorize spending authority for. And that contract can be split between multiple budget? It can be used by multiple offices provided they have the available funding. And so transportation, because, you know, the drivers must meet legal requirements and, uh, and, and have regular mm -hmm. periodic testing for CDLs. They have a budget. Uh, Grounds has the same CDL staff with, within its office. Um, and Dr. Allen can explain her involvement. We also assist with the CDL physicals, and because we have an absence management program, there are requirements under the law for recertification when an employee has had a health condition that may affect their commercial driver's license. So we are involved in sending for recertification when we have that notice from physicians that it's a potential um, diagnosis that could affect their driving. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, next in, item is... In the interest of time, Mr. Saris, I would recommend that we postpone discussion of JMI um, 60419, which I believe is next. Uh, I had LKO 40319, okay. but... I've been ahead trying to move us along here. Okay. Um, so let's do LKO. Um, JMI 60419, I would recommend that we postpone discussion. Um, several board members have questions about that. So we'll do that at the meeting. full board meeting? Let's do that at the full okay. board meeting. And, and number eight as well for roofing, or? Let's try to get through um, okay. items six through eight, or six okay. and eight, rather. Six and eight, okay. Uh, uh, no, that's fine. I don't. Uh, LKO 40319, transportation of select students and employees. This is a new contract for which competitive bids were solicited to provide for the transportation of select students for the Office of Transportation and the transportation of select employees for the Office of Human Resources Operations. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with three recommended bidders and contract spending authority uh, through 2023, five years, uh, of $5 million. Thank you, and I believe um, board members submitted questions on this contract as well. Yes. Good evening. Good evening, Vice Chair, board members. Um, I'll just go down the list of questions that were submitted. The first is, um, please give a breakdown of cost between different categories of this ex under this ex expenditure contract, and how many are special education, displaced students, and drug testing. Um, the first part is drug testing. Under this contract, that um, piece is new. So Dr. Allen worked with us to um, offer that. But in previous contract, that drug testing piece was, was not a part of the contract. So that piece is new. There, there will be no expenditure. Um, in addition to this being a new service provided to assist our administrators, we can't estimate cost because it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, um, depending on where the employee, the location of the employee being picked up. Um, by law, you also have to have the employee taken home. You also have to return the administrator to the school who is accompanying the employee. So based on, we estimate it based upon predicted numbers that we have from a trend over the last several years, but we have not utilized the contract to this point. Thank you. So for cab services, the monthly expenditure that we um, have been trending is between twenty-five and forty thousand dollars per month, and approximately forty percent of those cab trips are um, have been transporting students with special needs, and the other sixty have been for displaced students. 
Thank you. And I believe the there were a couple of, I'm sorry. Sorry. Please continue. Yes. Next question is, does the special education budget line item reimburse transportation services in any capacity? Um, the answer to that is no. There is no line transfer from Office of Special Education to the, to the Office of Transportation. I will note, however, that um, we do submit a report annually to MSTE. That report outlines the number of students who we transport. Um, those students must have transportation on their IEPs. And the school system does get a um, reimbursement from MSDE. So let me just correct uh, Mr. West. The, uh, the foundation funding program through which uh, BCPS gets about 41% of its total operating budget consists of five foundation programs, one of which is transportation. And it's not a, a reimbursement. It is, in effect, a direct grant, and it's a approximately $35 million a year, and that will adjust annually based on our enrollment and the reported number of students transported. Thank you. Thank you. And there's also a reimbursement question about other jurisdictions. So when, uh, through the out-of-county living program, when uh, BCPS takes students from other jurisdictions, those counties do reimburses for the, the local cost of education, a portion of which is transportation, but it's not a reimbursement. It's not linked to any level of service. It's just what that, what we, what it costs us to provide on a broad per pupil basis uh, in local county funds, and that's reimbursed. Okay. okay. Um, the board asked to expound on hypothetical examples under which um, different scenarios where the students will be provided transportation. Um, so the first scenario, which is typical, is that a student may be displaced and we would um, use a cab to provide transportation. And typically that is when a student has been identified as being displaced, um, we have a certain amount of time to provide transportation. If we are unable to do that with a school bus, uh, within a certain amount of time, and that is usually four days from the time that we receive the request, then we will um, authorize a cab to transport that student until such time as we're able to, to place that child on a, on a route. Sometimes that means we can just add the child to an existing route. Oftentimes, because they're displaced, they're, they're going outside of their catchment area, so we have to modify our routes, which takes a little bit more time. Second example, uh, will be private transportation. Um, typically this is uh, for students with special needs and we for um, some reason are unable to provide that service on a, on a school bus. So I should say that our number one um, goal is to transport all students on school buses. So that is, that is what we attempt to do first and foremost. When we're unable to do that, that is where this contract comes in. It provides another, another avenue of being able to provide transportation. So um, with private transportation, oftentimes we're um, looking to keep ride times to a minimum. Some students have um, a, doc a documented need for a very short ride time and um, that we may be unable to obtain that on a school bus. Also, there are parts of the county that we are physically unable to get a school bus to that child's location. Um, and the bus may not be able to turn around or physically cannot get down the street. However, we are obligated to provide transportation. So we will use private transport because they have um, much smaller vehicles. Okay. Um, Question number five is, does th this cover transportation to private placement facilities for special education? And yes, it does. So cabs or um, private transport, uh, private transportation um, do service schools that are not public. When transportation is used for students, are there uh, ap applicably trained um, and background check staff accompanying the students? So when we have students who need to be accompanied, um, that is our private transportation. Um, we don't have, uh, we don't pay staff to accompany students in cabs because typically if we're using a cab to transport, those students don't need to be accompanied. Um, but if we have 
private transportation, then yes, the staff have been trained to do that. This contract also does require any staff member who comes in contact with a student to have fingerprinting. That is done through BCPS so that we're able to monitor and keep track of anything changes with their status. That does include taxi drivers. So taxi cab companies also um, go through the uh, Public Service Commission, so there is a background check in order for them to become a taxi cab driver. However, this contract also requires them to go through BCPS to get fingerprinted. And number seven is, what other options has the system explored to meet these transportation needs? Have reimbursement options been explored? Um, the answer is there is a, um, a matrix, if you will, whenever we're determining the most appropriate method of transportation. And again, that first um, go-to is a school bus. Secondly, we do look at parent reimbursement. And so there are a number of students who um, their parents transport them and we reimburse them at the federal rate. Then we have taxi cab and then finally um, uh, private transport. So there is a, a, a tiering system that our staff goes through when they're making the determination to provide alternate transportation. Would you say that parents are generally made well aware of the option to be reimbursed if they choose to transport? Is that an option that is made known or offered and has a cost benefit analysis been performed on that over private transportation per se? Um, we. We do make that known because um, we, we do make that known. It is generally cheaper for a parent to transport. Um, we have not done a, a true comparison. I'd be happy to do that. Um, but just looking at the, the gross numbers, it is generally cheaper to reimburse a parent. Uh, we just make sure that the route is reasonable and um, they are reimbursed both ways to and from and the AM and the PM. Do you have any idea for those um, students eligible what percentage of parents um, do opt to provide their own transportation with reimbursement? I don't have that at my, at my fingertips. Um, so once we have provided transportation, if we provide um, a school bus and the parent chooses not to take the school bus, that doesn't make them necessarily eligible for parent transportation. Um, it is. Uh, parent reimbursement, I'm sorry, is a mechanism of transportation, it's a mode of transportation. So if we offer a school bus and there is no other reason why the child should not be on a school bus, then we don't necessarily offer it at that point because that means we'd, we'd offer it to everyone. Um, if for some reason the child is not successful on a school bus or we are not able to provide um, some level of service, then it is usually an agreement between us and the, and the parent that we will um, offer reimbursement. Sometimes we're asked, oftentimes we, we do ask the parent, is reimbursement an option? And if they say no, then we'll go to the other uh, forms of, of transportation. Given our current driver shortage, I'm yes, asking in that, that context mm -hmm. about thinking outside the box and sure. being creative and offering options to parents. I know that we have buses that travel quite some distance to transport students who, rightfully so, are entitled to that transportation. Sure. So I would like to find out how many parents do take advantage of that. Could be a win-win. No one cares for your student like a parent sometimes. So the quality of service I don't think would be a, a concern. If the cost is, in fact, less, um, that seems like a good potential option. So would appreciate if this committee could receive a report out on that participation and perhaps efforts to increase it. Other um, board member questions? Okay. So right one, one more last item, uh, JMI 60819, Roofing Repair Services and Associated Materials. This is a new time and materials contract for which competitive bids were solicited to provide on-call roofing repair services and associated materials for the Office of Facilities Support Services and Facilities Construction and Improvement. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with five recommended bidders and spending authority of $2 million over this five-year term. And we did have your 
questions. If you Good evening. Um, Good evening. Just wanted to give you a little bit of background. We have an aggressive roof replacement plan, and we'll be talking about it when we present our capital improvement program later tonight. This con in addition to that, we also have limited in-house capability of doing minor roof repairs. This contract provides additional support in that area and is only used when we need it. If we do not, we use our in-house resources. Uh, there are three questions on that. Uh, how do we know about the need for roof repair? Obviously, all of the requests for repairs are originated at the school. So either the building staff folks from the school or the school administration, they inform us of a roof leak or a roof-related problem, and we immediately try to schedule repairs either through in-house or using this contract. Uh, some of these repairs are minor, and some could be more extensive. The second question, are these roof repairs the result of prolonged replacement of roofs? Roofs become eligible for state funding after 15 years. And we have some roofs that are older than that. We have some roofs that have issues uh, before they become eligible for it. So depending on the need for individual roof, uh, regardless of whether we, it is eligible for replacement or not, the repairs have to be uh, taken care immediately. Because if we don't fix roof in time, there will be other damage to the building. And it wouldn't be very conducive to the edu educational environment. So to some extent, yes, we have aging infrastructure. And if we don't replace roof within 15, 20 years, they are more prone to issues. The third question is, how many schools where roof, roof repairs have been made? Um, from time to time, there are several schools. There are more than 50 schools that needed repairs under this contract, including this building you know, and other uh, locations. So depending on the need for the repair, it has to be taken care of in a relatively short time. So with that, if you have any additional question, I'll be more than glad to answer. Thank you. Ms. Rao? Do we have some sort of accountability system in place so that if a contractor replaces a roof and something happens to it in a certain period of time or it has problems, are there roof warranties on the newer roofs that we have, and how long are those for? Great question. Uh, yes, the answer is yes, yes to all of that. Uh, most of the roofs have at least 15 years of warranty, but new roofs that we are replacing now, because of the better quality of available material available, the roof warranties are 25 years. But not all roof repairs are covered under warranty. So even though we may have new roof, there may be issues. For example, storm-related damage. That is not covered under warranty. A normal wear and tear is covered under warranty. So the answer to your question is warranties are part of roof replacement. And if the, if the roof repairs are included in that warranty, we do call the original contractor and ask them to repair the roof. And in weather-related damage, we are insured. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Board members, do I have a motion to recommend to the full board for its approval items I-1 through I-6 and I-8? Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor, please raise your hands. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. The meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee is concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.